yes. Good afternoon to good day to you all. Uh, welcome uh, in joining us. Um, it is a great pleasure to uh, well, to welcome to introduce an old friend, Daya Tusu. We know each other from the International Association of Media Research. I remember Stockholm, uh, among other places, and from London. Uh, Daya Tusu's um, background ranges from Kashmir to study in Delhi, uh, work in London for a long time at Westminster University, um, work in Beijing, and now in Hong Kong. In other words, this is a multi-centric background and outlook which he is bringing to his media research, which is fundamentally important to us. So please, a great welcome, a warm welcome to Daya Tusu, please. <laughs> Thanks, Daya, for, for uh, joining us at an early morning for you. Welcome, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Anne, for that um, very nice introduction. Um, I, I have to confess when I said that I'll be doing this, uh, when I was invited to do a seminar from the symposium and I agreed, I did not account for the time difference because <laughs> I, I was I was hoping hoping that I will be in London by this time in May so I said to Jan give me uh, as I mean a date as further uh, in the semester as possible and uh, you know Brett and uh, Jan offered me this late 19th and I said that's perfectly fine I, I was hoping to be in London by then um, but lo and behold I'm in, in Hong Kong and it's 3.30 in the morning. Um, so I, uh, you know, so if I don't sound as coherent as I ought to be, uh, please uh, forgive me for that because um, it, it's, it's a very um, odd hour to be doing an academic seminar. Um, but it's also an honor and a privilege to be talking to a group of uh, very distinguished scholars uh, from different disciplines uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a truly global studies kind of context, because as Jan uh, was saying earlier, um, we are, um, we, we sort of talk about it quite a lot. The word global uh, has been um, overused, um, but uh, often uh, from a kind of global is how X relates to the West basically. And we haven't really talked about uh, the globalization or global studies from a slightly more complex, multi-centric perspective. Now, um, if, if I may add well, one thing about yes. the situation now, joining us are people from the Netherlands, Japan, um, Germany, um, and Hungary, uh, so several other countries and probably some others will be joining us as we go along. So the, the, the setting is already a bit multi no, Thank you. That's, that's very good to know. Um, so I, uh, I am I'm sort of going to talk about uh, a particular aspect of this um, globalization of uh, the internet and within that I'm going to be focusing on uh, BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, and that's a huge topic in itself. So I'm going to further narrow it down and look at the two major BRICS nations, uh, China and India, mostly China, because uh, as luck would have it, I'm now um, located in the Sino space and it's a it's actually both intellectually and culturally a very interesting experience because uh, a lot is happening here which is uh, changing the world in in some ways uh, fundamentally um, and as they say contemporaries are often very bad observers of the realities around them because they're living through it um, but uh, so even you know just being an observer outside 
observer and seeing the, the shift um, in discourses, in power relations, um, also in the digital space is a fascinating experience for somebody who studies global uh, issues. Um, so I will um, talk briefly about BRICS because uh, BRICS is not as well known as a category of analysis, uh, especially I think in the United States. Um, and, and then I'll talk about the internet within BRICS countries and I'll talk about how the, that is changing and what it means to the way we have traditionally uh, thought about the internet as an American phenomenon, which is what we should because it was developed and it's still largely controlled by corporations based in the United States. Um, but how that is changing and what that means to um, this kind of digital world we are now going to be living in in the coming decades is something I will be reflecting towards the end of my lecture. So let me, uh, I've got a short PowerPoint. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? Um, yeah. Okay. No, I won't it. Let me. Okay. So, uh, you won't let me do the full screen for some reason. Shall I get out and do it again? It's not allowing me to go full screen for some reason. I'm sorry. Brett knows about these things, Daya. <laughs> you sound bad. I hit okay, F5. Let... Sorry? F5. F5? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. So um, let me just start with, as I said, uh, BRICS. So um, as we know, BRIC started as a collection of four countries initially, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And uh, it's creation was actually quite interesting because it happened after the 2008 uh, economic um, crisis in the United States and then globally. The idea was that uh, some major non-Western economies decided to get together and see we, so to talk about how we should be dealing with this kind of a global crisis. Um, as you see on this, uh, uh, this slide, since 2009, the BRICS countries are meeting every year. They have an annual summit. Um, although the idea actually originally came from Russia, but it was um, appropriated, if you like, by China. And China also insisted that it should have representation from Africa, and therefore South Africa was added to the group and it became BRICS. Um, and the Chinese idea of uh, being part of this major non-Western coalition of nations, very, very informal actually, uh, although they have this annual summit, they have a BRICS bank now, but it's largely a, uh, one of those geopolitical coalitions, um, which has its uses, but you know, it's not as coherent as uh, some of these countries might think they are. But the point about BRICS in relation to China uh, was that it wanted to show to the world that it's not just China is rising, although some people argue China is today a risen power, but there are other big non-Western nations which are also rising. So the message to the West was, don't be scared of the rise of China. And I think it, it, it was something that China used uh, very strategically to create a, 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 a coalition of large non-Western countries, uh, not necessarily as a counter to the West, but as a su supplement to global uh, geopolitical narratives. Um, now, these five countries are very diverse. 
um, you can think of uh, you know more diverse countries than um, Brazil and and China, for example. And all these five countries have a key relation in the world with the United States. So there's this bilateral and multilateral relations uh, these countries have with other nations and US is important for all of them. Um, at the same time, they have their own, uh, if you like a niche arena where they are discussing various issues, including, as I said before, creating the BRICS Bank, which by the way, was one of the first multilateral organization to give uh, funding for the COVID relief. Um, now, my association with this has been um, through a colleague uh, in uh, Finland, uh, Professor Karl in Nordenstrang, who did a major uh, project on BRICS media. It was the first time uh, a kind of extent, extensive project was undertaken to study the media in these five countries. Um, and I was associated with that project. It ran from 2012 to 2016, and we were able to produce um, a few things, including um, this book we produced in 2015, which was the first dedicated book looking at media in these five countries. Then we did one uh, in 2017, which was specifically looking at journalism uh, in the five nations based on uh, detailed uh, empirical research. We had teams in all the five countries. And then most recently, uh, it was early this year, uh, we produced the final book uh, that I was uh, involved in editing uh, with Professor Nordenstrang on um, this, BRICS, this BRICS media reshaping the global communication order. Um, so this is a bit kind of, you know, high, high sounding title, but um, the argument centrally in the book was that there, there's a lot of change happening within the, because even within this project, by the time we were coming to the end of this, um, the intra BRICS con conflicts and complications had become much more pronounced, but also the rise of China as a um, counter to the West had become very, very important uh, in all, all domains, including in the digital, uh, a part, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on uh, in in today's lecture. It's um, I'm not going to be talking about a lot of the other three BRICS nations, um, although Russia is very important in terms of the internet. Um, but um, given the time constraints, and uh, I will I'll be focusing on both China and India because the the scale of change in in these two nations, uh, given their size, their scale. Uh, is very, very important. And um, also, I think it's, again, for global studies perspective, it's important to emphasize that uh, we're talking about not just nation states, but we're talking about civilizational states. And uh, therefore, the, when we talk about the rise of China, it's not just an economic power, it is a power with a very long and complex history and a very different worldview to what, um, you know, we have can come to ap appreciate in terms of Westphalian system of how the world is organized. Um, so I'm going to, before I talk about internet in particular, I want to just um, highlight some of the kind of economic and political changes that have um, happened in the last few years and often do not get as much attention as perhaps they deserve. Um, so, for example, in this COVID year, last year, uh, a very interesting change happened with the part which was appreciated apart from very few um, specialists, um, not really uh, didn't make global headlines. And that's about the, uh, the corporate power. So, sorry, I'll come back. I just want to, so today's uh, lecture is based essentially on this chapter I wrote in the book, um, BRICS De-Americanizing the Internet, it's a 10,000 word uh, chapter. Uh, I'm hoping to develop it into a, a, a single author book at some stage when I have more time and I have a, a 
kind of duplicate you can write ghost stuff for me i don't have one at the moment but um so so I, i'm i'm really going to be summarizing some of the key points the the the, the, uh, the, the details are in that chapter so I, I just want to go back to what i was saying earlier i'm sorry i missed this right um is this corporate power shift so this is uh, i did some data crunching uh, looking at uh, fortune 500 companies um and as you see here from in the last two decades um there is a phenomenal shift in terms of where the power has actually moved so last year was significant for the first time in history there were more companies in global 500 which were chinese than american uh, it didn't make global headlines i thought it should have because it's a very important signal uh, of of that change of course you could argue that these companies are global they have investment from various parts you know there might be oil shake putting money in it there might be russian oligarch putting money in a chinese company um, but there is a, a underlying trend that you know when we talk about this this decentered world we don't know where the power is well actually that is not true uh, a little research will show you the power is very clearly uh, located in certain parts of the world even in this digital age so um we've seen this extraordinary shift so every every five years the number of companies which are chinese in in uh, fortune 500 have doubled and there is a corresponding decline in the companies based in the United States. Now, obviously, you know, Fortune has been doing this since 1950s. So it's not um, something that the Chinese government has manipulated the, uh, the, or, or massaged the figures to show how wonderful their economy is. This is a well-known American commercial magazine, and it is it, it gives you all the data that you need. So something quite significant is happening in that space. Um, and then we have this, um, the so-called BRI, which uh, is, in fact, uh, on the, the, the making changes on the ground as we speak. Um, and it has a, a maritime dimension, it has a land-based dimension, but it also has a polar dimension. So one, one road, one belt, one pole, that is the slogan. Um, and just by way of comparison, I would encourage you to think of the Marshall Plan and think of how that reshaped European politics, European culture, European economy, how it got Americans into that continent and they're still there very much. And then multiply that both geographically and in terms of types of projects that the BRI uh, projects uh, include, you get a, a picture of how significant it is. Um, of course, uh, for people who study these things, they, they know what's happening, politicians know, but I don't think in our global studies, we uh, take it as, as seriously. Um, but it is extremely significant because actually changing the realities on the ground. Uh, even more interesting is the um, changing geopolitics of global trade. Um, this was a, a uh, this map I borrowed from a book called Connectography, written by Parag Khanna, who is now based in in uh, Singapore, um, and it looks at the countries with which China uh, has you know, best trade relations as against, like big, the biggest trading partner as against the United States. So as you see there, 124 to 56. This is um, slightly older data. There are more, the, the figures have gone, figures have gone up now. There are more countries which have um, China as the uh, most important trading partner. Um, and as, as you would know, with BRI, just kind of reinforce that point, um, even Italy, which is a G7 country, has uh, joined uh, BRI. And interestingly, India, the BRICS partner, was the only major economy which decided not to uh, join uh, for, for geopolitical reasons, primarily because um, the 
um, one of the major BRI projects, which is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a $60 billion project. Some of that passes through um, territory, which is claimed by both India and China and Pakistan. So no country, no government in Delhi would formally said, yes, this is okay, uh, say this is okay. So therefore there has been a um, kind of, uh, you know, within the BRICS, uh, it has been a, an issue, uh, a, a contested issue. Um, these projects also have a very significant uh, communication uh, dimension. Um, as most of you would know, Chinese um, investment, like most investment, is not without strings attached to it. And uh, especially in many parts of the developing world of the global south, Chinese investment comes up with very clearly defined uh, objectives. So, for example, in parts of uh, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, a lot of these BRI projects are connected with um, digital connectivity, they would say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll offer you the free broadband access, we we'll offer you satellite connectivity, but then you have to um, have our news channels or our entertainment channels uh, to be shown to your audience. Uh, having so, so China is very significant in this, and I'll come back to the digital aspect in a minute, um, or the, the internet in a minute. But also, I want to um, reinforce the fact that despite these changes, and they're undergoing as we speak, and they've been going on for many years now, um, when we look at the digital world, um, it is still very much shaped globally. If you forget China for a moment, if you look at the global picture, it is still very much shaped by United States and hugely powerful corporations based there. Um, so for instance, if you look at the big guys in this arena, um, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, uh, these are trillion dollar companies and um, they have so much cash to spare. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, they, they, their um, resource base is humongous, uh, hugely uh, more powerful than many GDPs uh, in, in, in many parts of the world. So um, extremely, extremely powerful. And that has not, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, for example, as I was saying earlier about the rise of China in this field, uh, you know, the reality is that China is operating in a system globally, which is still very much dominated, uh, shaped, controlled even by, uh, basically four or five companies. Um, and they're not just providing the software, the platforms, they're also very strong in infrastructure. So um, this uh, map shows you that, um, and this is an older data uh, in those uh, four years, uh, the numbers of uh, this undersea cables have become even more pronounced. Uh, the New York Times did a very interesting story last year, uh, looking at the, the, you know, the, how traffic travels, internet traffic travels under the sea. Um, and here you see the major players, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, etc., also extremely important in the, uh, providing the, the infrastructure for internet. Um, it's something that often, uh, social scientists do not engage with very much, um, but in my view, a fundamental uh, aspect of uh, global internet. Um, and you can, you, can, you can take it back to the 19th century. And you know, I have written about it extensively that the whole idea of cabling the world in the 19th century and gave this head start to Britain, for example, initially, and then other European powers. Uh, so this is uh, something which one should remember, you know, that even in, in the 19th century, a lot of that money came from private corporations, of course, with very explicit support at that time from this, the states. Um, similarly, in terms of, uh, you know, 
mechanisms of, of, of the internet, US domination is phenomenal. Just to give a sense of browsers, um, if you, this is just a compilation of um, the, the actual global share of um, who dominates the internet. Uh, this, this again, part of infrastructure. And you see 65%, more than 65% is Chrome, followed by Safari, Edge, uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer. So if you look at how many of these are American, um, overwhelming. QQ, which is the Chinese version, 1.29%. Yandex, which is Russian, 0.5%. So again, uh, you know, there's a tendency to, uh, you know, overplay this idea that the, the Chinese are coming, they're going to take over the internet. Um, I think one has to be slightly more skeptical. And the, the advantage I have, as I was saying earlier, that I am an out outsider, so I can observe it slightly, uh, you know, perhaps slightly more objectively. Um, and this isn't surprising because, as we know, internet was conceived, evolved, developed, uh, managed, uh, uh, controlled even um, by the United States. It, it was, as we know, a, a, a Cold War project. It had very clear association with defense and security establishment. It was only in the 1990s it opened up and it was privatized and globalized. Young generation doesn't realize uh, the the involvement of the state power in creating uh, the this amazing um, instrument for global communication. Um, so it, it isn't surprising at all. And in fact, it can be argued, and some people have done that, um, that with globalization, the uh, the control has actually increased to the extent that. Some scholars today speak of surveillance capitalism. That's actually, you know, everything we do uh, in, in free democracies is uh, essentially monitored, managed, manipulated by a, a very, very few uh, hugely powerful corporations, which are not accountable to anyone, uh, except their shareholders and some favorable politicians. Um, so that's the reality. But a parallel reality is that although internet was developed and managed and controlled by the United States and governed by United States and companies based there, its usage has changed. It, its usage has changed fundamentally. Um, here is how. So in 1995, when uh, internet was beginning to be globalized, privatized, 61% of people who use the internet were Americans. By 2014, that had shrunk to 10%. Today, it is a, a single digit number. Um, at the same time, the largest growth has been in Asia, which isn't surprising, and that's why I want to focus on Asia because, and, and two major countries in Asia, because uh, that accounts for half the internet usage in the world. Um, data uh, compiled more recently um, shows that internet users, um, of course, 2.5 billion people in Asia have access. Now, this is October 2020, these figures change every month because so many more people are joining it. And I would argue with the pandemic, in fact, it has received a new boost because people have been forced to go digital um, for various reasons I don't need to explain. I think it's more interesting to look at the penetration rate. So in North Africa, it is 90 plus percent. In Europe is 87 percent. In Asia, it's still 60 percent. Um, actually lower than world average. So there is a huge potential for growth as is in Africa, uh, uh, because these are areas where still uh, a huge amount of untapped, uh, you know, uh, base is there for, for uh, consumers. 
Um, if you look at the top 10 internet users, of course, China is at the top, followed by India, then US, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, Russia, Japan, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Again, this is a year old data. So China is now a billion, uh, India is touching 800 million. But the interesting figure is on the other column, uh, percentage not online. Right? So United States, 4% not online. Japan, 10% not online. In Pakistan, nearly 60% not online. In India, 46% not, not, not online. Now they translate that into numbers, given India has nearly 1.4 billion pe uh, people. Right? We're talking about the entire population of the United States and Western Europe, just one country. Um, and the, the expansion is phenomenal because uh, of largely cheap Chinese uh, smartphones, uh, internet enabled smartphones, which have really revolutionized um, the access. It has reached to uh, village level. Uh, and of course, uh, pandemic has, uh, been a very important uh, factor in accelerating that. Um, so given that sort of broader background, I, I want to now focus on both India and China. And I know Chinese internet gets a lot of uh, uh, sort of critical analysis, understandably, because it's seen as a threat to uh, the dominant structures. Um, and as we know, we are going through a digital cold war. So China is important, but I'll talk about China in a minute. I want to talk uh, before that about India, which uh, often doesn't get as, as much uh, attention for very, very understandable reasons. Um, but the growth there, as you see here, you know, it's, it's, it is the second largest internet in the world. In fact, I've argued it is the biggest open internet in the world because the Chinese one, as we know, is not open. And again, you see in the last two decades, the growth has been phenomenal from 5.5 million people to now, just to go back to the previous slide, nearly 700. Today, today is like nearly 800 million people, which still means that there are nearly 500 million people um, who are not online. Um, and they are increasingly getting on uh, the digital superhighways um, for various reasons. Um, and that is creating a different kind of discussion, different kind of narrative. The, the idea that internet is an English language phenomena, it's an American phenomena, is increasing, increasingly being, being challenged by this, if you like, vernacularization of, of the internet. Um, and one of the transformational change has been with the, uh, a kind of interesting convergence between a um, very pro-business government, which has been in power since 2014, and a very active uh, corporate um, culture, particularly one uh, organization, uh, which uh, is uh, that the company called Reliance, which is one of the most important country uh, uh, companies in India with investment in various arenas, including energy and telecommunication. And, this thing called GEO was introduced only in 2016, and it has grown phenomenally. It's got like 400 million subscribers and, uh, and growing by the day. So this is a really interesting convergence between um, a pro-business uh, government, although a lot of what gets written about uh, what's happening in India is often framed in relation to Hindu nationalism, which is an interesting aspect. But this corporate connection and how pro-business this government is often doesn't get as much uh, uh, kind of attention as it probably deserves. Um, 
and it is really making a huge change uh, on on the ground. Um, so, if we look at uh, in terms of comparative uh, framework, so Geo is only five years old, and it is already operating in different verticals, whether it is fin financial technology, whether it's browsing services, publishing, streaming, et cetera, et cetera. It's not quite there with the amazons of the world, but in five years already operating in 22 different uh, so, you know, verticals. Uh, that, that's a phenomenal growth. Um, people who study the internet often do not uh, engage with this because it is not a, a, a platform which is challenging um, the domination of the before mentioned uh, top uh, digital superpowers. Um, and also the platforms that they are using, for example, the largest uh, audience for Facebook in the world is in India. The largest audience for WhatsApp is in India. Um, Google is huge. So the platforms they're using, the infrastructure they're using is essentially American. So it's not an issue for big corporations because you know they, they, they want to keep the Indian authorities happy. So they will take stuff down from uh, you know, Facebook or WhatsApp to make sure that they stay in this, uh, not only a huge market, but also potentially you know, growing, continuously growing. It's already, as I said before, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, I mean, it's already the second largest, but it's, it's given the demographics, which is again, a very important aspect. Um, you know, 70% of Indians are below the age of 35. You know, translate that into numbers. So we're talking about 700 million people, increasingly educated, increasingly mobile, and, uh, you know, digitally savvy. And of course, with the last year and a half, this whole uh, uh, phenomena of, uh, um, you know, the COVID uh, catastrophe has obviously made a huge difference in terms of people being affected, uh, you know, getting back into poverty trap, etc. Uh, the informal sector, for example, but at the same time. Um, it has also forced people to actually get on with the uh, digital uh, platforms to, for example, getting the state subsidies, uh, you know, direct transfer of cash, for instance, et cetera. And it would have been in, uh, incredibly more difficult to manage that if there wasn't an infrastructure in place for this kind of direct transfer to the poorest in India. Um, Unlike Indian uh, internet, the Chinese internet gets a lot more uh, attention. And that isn't surprising given China's power uh, and not just in the digital space. Um, but much of what is written about it, uh, both in policy discourse as well as in academic writing is largely focused on one key aspect and that is censorship and control. Um, if you were to do a Google Scholar search and look at articles and books about Chinese internet, uh, even written by Chinese scholars, you will find the majority of them are about uh, censorship and control, which is perfectly legitimate uh, because this is the fundamental aspect of uh, you know, how people communicate. There should be freedom of expression and uh, you know, unfettered freedom, maybe not unfettered, but, you know, sufficient freedom. Um, but in the process, perhaps we have missed out on something very significant, which is the digital uh, commerce, the, the economic aspect of what China has achieved, even in digital space. And, um, Perhaps there is a, 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 a limitation in the way it has been framed in Western narratives, and the, too much focus on, on censorship and regulation. Um, and the process we probably have missed out a bigger, bigger story. 
Um, I wrote something on this and I called it Cyber Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics. Uh, this was a book we published in 2018. Um, it's called China's Media Go Global. And um, I was looking at these. Uh, so every, every major digital platform that you and I use has an equivalent Chinese platform. I can't think of any other country which has done that. Uh, France, Germany, Brazil, India, UK, uh, Japan, you know, serious players. But they're quite happy to use the American platforms. Russia to some extent, but nothing in the scale of this. So as you see, every major um, digital property has a Chinese equivalent. And these are not just confined today to the territorial space of China. They are going global. And therefore, what I said before, the BRI connection is very significant. Um, so for instance, if you think of um, cloud computing, uh, Alibaba is quite there at the top of the, I mean, of course, arena is still dominated by the United States, but Alibaba is a pretty serious player in that. Um, so I have argued, and others have too, that precisely because they control the, uh, you know, access or market access, especially to the Googles and Facebooks of the world, that they were able to develop their own. So you could argue it was a very clever policy decision. So, you know, we liberals can get, uh, you know, cross about it and say how bad it is, authoritarian system, control of ideas, et cetera, et cetera. We say, okay, that's fine. It's your conversation. We're doing something else. We are creating a different internet. And we are 1.4 billion people. Uh, our, our reserves are $3 trillion. Uh, we can buy up stuff if you want. And that's what exactly what we're doing. And there is a world outside the Anglo-American world. That's the world we are focusing on. Um, so again, a very significant shift and not something which has happened in, in a decade. It's been going on for at least uh, you know, three decades. Gradually, they have allowed it to expand. So um, if you look at some of their major companies, it's just a compilation of some of these from Baidu to uh, you know, TikTok, Baidu, uh, Dance, uh, Alibaba, et cetera. And you see the, the different verticals in which they operate. Um, it, it is incredible. We do not associate until a decade ago, maybe two decades ago, China with cutting edge technology. It was a factory to the world. It was creating phones for Apple. It was not something which was, I mean, they, they, as I said before, 75% of smartphones in India are manufactured in China. It's the second largest market in the world. Uh, and that's also the case in many other uh, developing countries. Daya, round off in five minutes. Yeah. I, I might need another, yeah, ten, maybe seven minutes. Okay, I'm coming right, to, to sure. the end, yeah. Um, similarly, the um, debate about Internet of Things, AI, again, um, 5G, especially China is ahead of everybody else. Um, we, we known about Huawei and how it has been, you know, um, the kind of big geopolitical contestation in many countries, including in, in, in BRICS partners of, of China. Um, again, you see here the patents um, largely uh, based, uh, I mean, largest number of patent applications which came, come from companies based in China. Um, and it's also, I mentioned infrastructure before. Um, so of course the big guys are involved, but so are the little guys. China is very, very important in this and creating these, um, you know, infrastructure for a different kind of internet. And I think that's really important to take into account. Also significant is uh, digital currency because uh, mobile payment system in, the, in China is perhaps one of the most advanced given the size and, and, and complexity of its population. 
uh, we're not talking about it in Denmark or you know, um, you know, we're talking about a very complicated country, continent sized country. And they're doing this because they realize their currency is not uh, global currency that remains, a, 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 as you see on this compilation, uh, largely a dollar story, right? 62% of foreign exchange reserves are in dollars and then Euro, et Yen, et cetera. So then B is 2%. So therefore you have to again, connect that the, 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 the problem they have with the, you know, internationalizing their currency and the idea that we could live forward by going digital and therefore digitization is really important aspect. Let me then um, end with a few reflections and uh, they probably would have time for some discussion, questions, et cetera. Um, I, I used to title post-COVID world, which I think is an uh, maybe uh, not sort of premature kind of I think, given what's happening in India, my own country at the moment, uh, and the potential of these variants developing anywhere in the world and you know, our inability to understand it. But I think it's like when BRICS was established in 2009, there was another interesting uh, marker for the disruption of the globalization discourse, that a certain version of Anglo globalization, the corporate globalization was being challenged by some major nations. I think something similar is happening with COVID because its implications are so much deeper and wider across the globe. And I think uh, in that space, uh, what happens to uh, digital uh, uh, arena would be also interesting to, to speculate on. Um, so, just in terms of BRICS itself, again, I you know don't want to go into detail, but the point is that, as I said at the very beginning, as a, as a grouping, it has very serious problems. Most recently, we saw the uh, India-China border clash last year, and if India gets out of it, then that's end of BRICS. And the Chinese are already talking about the idea of BRICS. Plus, they want to include countries like uh, Indonesia, Nigeria, uh, Turkey, Iran, most importantly, they've just signed a major deal with them, uh, you know, $400 billion, massive deal. Uh, and of course, the shift is moved from uh, away from BRICS to BRI. Um, one uh, major debate about uh, the new internet or this com com decentered internet is going to be, and it's already quite pronounced in certain parts of the world, about the cyber sovereignty as well as data localization. And it's not just a debate uh, which uh, is concerned with big American companies. Um, uh, people, for example, in India are very concerned that their data uh, through the, this mobile infrastructure is actually going to the Chinese. And you may remember um, last year, TikTok, which had the largest audience for TikTok was in India. Uh, that was banned in India and it continues to be banned. And the suggestion was that they are having access to our data. And uh, so the, the data localization debate is going to be very important coming years. Uh, competing platform imperialisms. Um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff written about uh, the, you know, US based platforms, but now you have competition. And uh, again, connect the dots with BRI, et cetera. Uh, is going to be an interesting uh, phenomenon to observe, uh, including in, uh, especially in the Southern perspective, Southern, you know, hemisphere of the globe. Um, digital Cold War and weaponization of information. Here again, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff uh, we see every, almost every week, there's a story in New York Times or The Economist uh, to tell us how the Russians are going to, you know, subvert democracy of the Chinese. Um, but it's not just one way, you know, there are cases of the other side also doing it. So we're again, just, you know, we're old enough to remember the Cold War uh, world. So it's like, you know, something similar happening. Um, digital for development, this I want to just use one minute to uh, emphasize this point that um, often in the discourses of internet, this, this aspect is not given the prominence it deserves. Um, and again, China has done phenomenally well 
um, last year they actually announced officially that they have no extreme poverty, zero. Um, 30 years ago, they had 700 million people living in extreme poverty. Uh, my own country, which has done okay in terms of reducing extreme poverty, but nowhere near China, nowhere near China. Uh, in fact, as I said before, with this COVID, a large proportion of poorest Indians have been pushed back below the poverty line. Um, and again, the role of digital technology for development is very significant. And China has done some really interesting um, experiment with that which can be replicated and are being replicated elsewhere in the developing world. And that raises interesting questions about the whole aid industry and this whole idea of, you know, Western foreign policy that we, we give aid to Africa. So if you're sitting in Africa and you're getting money from uh, this authoritarian government in Beijing, you, you're interested in getting a cheap internet access and you don't have a lecture on human rights. So it sort of works well for them. Um, finally, there's also a, um, we've seen most recently in terms of COVID, this idea of deglobalization. Um, you know, we saw in all its glory how nation state became important. We saw that in, in, in European Union most strikingly, when Italy was very severely affected, there was no policy in Brussels how to deal with that problem. They got support from China of all places because China, Italy was one of the countries which had joined BRI. Very interesting case. Um, it, was, it took Europeans several months to get their act together and have a coherent policy about how to deal at, at an EU level. Um, and more broadly, this idea of de-Americanizing, which uh, is what the title of the talk today is, uh, I think given what I've said in relation to these two countries, uh, it's going to be increasingly a de-Americanized internet. And in Chinese case, it already is. And because China is uh, globalizing at a level which is uh, massively important, uh, it won't be surprising that in the coming decades, we'll have this kind of, uh, you know, we're already speaking about this, like the balkanization of the internet and the kind of authoritarian versus democratic internet, et cetera. But they sound very interesting categories for us academics, but in the real world, I think, um, as we've seen with mobile communication, especially 5G, I think it's going to be an interesting space to observe. And um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Dias, thank you so much. This is formidable. Uh, on the chat, I have already asked, oh, wait a minute. It's, yeah, my audio is on. Uh, ask questions. Um, I'll slip in a remark first and then I go over. Um, I think that a key point, the internet is becoming Asian. Some point or a question, the complex relations between states and corporations taking into account that the states in question are all very different. And then another question, so the internet is becoming Asian, the internet is being decentered and de-Americanizing. What does it matter in your takeaway out of these trends that you chart so formidably, what what is the importance in, in, in political and cultural terms of these changes? Uh, and then, of, so let me leave it at that. And I go to questions uh, after this. Uh, Daya, you want to react? Here I see Marcus with a question. Marcus from Erfurt, Germany. Uh, sh sh should I respond to your question first? Or shall I yes, please, first? please, if, okay. if you can. Sure. Yes, of course, thank you. Um, of course, the it becoming a Asian with or, or internet with Asian accent is is a really a basic point because it's just numbers are such. Um, I think the more interesting question is the relationship between state and corporations. Um, 
I, I had the example of both China and India, but in Chinese case, it's a very different kind of capitalism. It's a state-sponsored capitalism, as we've seen most recently in case of Alibaba, uh, how Mr. Ma was silenced. He was not allowed to, you know, uh, he, he wanted to do something which was not approved. I don't know the details, but it was obvious that there was a problem. So it, 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 it's not, you know, it's, it's very clear that we're dealing with a one-party state. It's an authoritarian system. It's a very controlled system. That's why I emphasized when I was talking about the Chinese internet. That is the reality. That's the given. But we give too much importance to that at the, and, and the, at, at the expense of not looking at the, the kind of economics of it. And I think that's what the, the point I was making in relation to the Chinese internet. But the, in terms of implications, I mean, of course, um, it is um, something that uh, a lot of people have commented on this idea of an authoritarian uh, internet, you know, uh, idea of a controlled um, discourse, if you like. Um, and that for, I mean, I, I grew up in the freest country in the world. I lived in the in very free environment in, in London for 30 years. And even here in Hong Kong, which is you know, changing as we know, but uh, so far there hasn't been anything very overtly influencing what we teach or how we teach. But, you know, in, in mainland, that's a different story. So it, it is an interesting, um, kind of question about how it might impact on, um, you know, so, th so there is this already a debate about um, authoritarian versus democratic internet. And I think that debate is going to be uh, increasingly uh, more prominent and is a integral part of what is now called certain Cold War 2.0. Um, but within democracies too, there is a lot of debate, uh, and it's not a kind of, you know, it's not a uh, binary. It's more complicated than that, because um, the idea of, uh, for example, surveillance capitalism in most advanced economies like the United States is very deeply entrenched in the way people use social media and, and internet more generally, and the, you know, trading of data is also a major concern. And as we've seen in, in the European context, the European Union has had, um, you know, it's taken uh, very, very important initiatives in terms of privacy, et cetera, which is a very different approach than what you have in the United States, for example. So within the so-called democratic internet, there are variations. And I think that's, that's something, so it's really very hard to kind of make a general statement, but it's also the case that the Chinese internet is I mean, it's very hard to predict, but it's very difficult to see it not being state controlled, not being a one party you know, system. And, and the, the very strong connection between the uh, so-called corporate world and the party structure are so deeply intertwined, it's difficult to take them as separate entities. Thank you very much, Daya. Please, uh, Marcus, and then Felicia, maybe combine them, it's over to you. Please, Marcus. Thank you, this was really fascinating. Um, the question that I would like to ask you is about um, intersecting trends and forces. Um, I mean, the internet is still a very young kind of medium. Um, in the 90s, there was all this excitement about it would create a global village and democracy. It coincided uh, with since the 80s, the big wave of democratization. Later on, all those hopes were so disappointed when the internet became much more uh, consumerist, um, a capitalist kind of um, a, a template. And now we see, as you uh, show it to us, um, the de-Americanization. But could, would you think um, this, these um, sort of phases in the development of the internet are just part within a larger uh, kind of um, shift. Uh, maybe um, Polanyi's uh, term of a great transformation could apply here. Um, and if that is also a great transformation, where then is civil society? 
Um, how do you see maybe from the BRICS, maybe from the European Union, is civil society sleeping out all these trends? Um, where is where the counter forces pushing um, to regulate, uh, take back the power, whether it is from the US, from China, from Chinese government, or from Amazon and Alphabet and so on. So question about civil society in a great transformation, how would you see that? Thank you. Shall I, shall I respond again or should I wait for Can. You? Yeah, Daya, that's fine. Yeah, okay, because that's a very important question. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Um, of course, from the very beginning of the internet, um, and as you said, it was not just the idealism of the academics like you and me and the you know NGO world and all that. Um, it actually made a huge difference the way people connected and around the world there are examples of very active active civil society groups. Um, operating, uh, you know, and we've seen most recently in the COVID situation in my own country, uh, there's a lot of work being done by individuals, by civil society groups, by activists, uh, despite all the problems using the connectivity that the internet offers to help people, to, to provide the kind of provision that the state has failed to provide. Um, and where you are in Europe, of course, there is a much more, uh, and I, I suppose you are in Germany. Germany has a very strong tradition of this whole, uh, you know, kind of civil society. You know, you might even have a green, um, you know, chancellor in September, who knows? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, parallel dimension to, 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 of course, the big players are alphabets and, and Googles of the world, and they're not going to go anytime soon. In fact, they are becoming more important. But this is, as you say, it's a transformational change. So there are various strands in it. And I think the, the civil society groups are, the, the, the fact that we are having this conversation, I'm sitting in my study in Hong Kong, and you are in Germany, and this is in you know California, that itself shows the, the power of this connectivity. I mean, I, I, if I was teaching a global studies course, I would have every day a, a scholar from different part of the globe, you know, and you can do that today. So that's just one aspect of what you can do with this technology. It's like, it's like a double-edged sword. It depends what you do with it, you know, and these debates are not new. When, when, when radio came on the scene, people were saying the same things. It's going to be all about entertainment and talk shows and same with television. They'll say it'll be like, you know, a, 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 a mechanism to make us better consumers. And even in China, which is supposed to be this authoritarian state, consumerism is rampant and much grosser than you see anywhere in the world, you know. So, so I, I think, you know, the, it, I don't see a contradiction in this. So you will have a large chunk of it, which is, you know, just TikToking, if you like. And then you have people who are using this connectivity to create alternative narratives, but that they are activists, they are, you know, civil society groups, they are niche audiences, they are academic. And I think that's, a, that's not going to go anytime soon. In fact, I think as awareness grows of this, uh, there will be more of it. Not, not less. So it will be a parallel universe, if you like. Thank you. Thanks there. Felicia and, and Kim, Kim, Kim Sipes, please, Felicia. I, thank you for, this was such a fun presentation and such an engaging portrait. Uh, thank thank you, you for bringing it to this space. Uh, really, I enjoyed it so much. Um, my, my question follows Marcus as well and is a little bit in two parts. So first, I'm wondering if you could speak to the nature of sort of the social, but also the environmental critique or pushback to these now very large corporations. Uh, and what are people, you know, what what is their critique? Is their impact seen socially and in family dynamics or, or that sort of thing? But also in terms of uh, the environmental question of these major companies, it struck me the, the underwater cable networks. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, um, how, how are environmental 
things going on with this with this construction and this expansion and to that end uh what kind of cybersecurity threats would expansion of this system pose uh in i'm in los angeles right now and it seems like we had a uc uh data hack and so like all uc employees have had their information now on the dark web and and it's like every day there's another one so i'm wondering if you could speak to some of the nature of, of those questions with the issues you brought. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, sorry. Jan, you're saying something? Yeah, maybe uh, combine with, with okay. Kim Swipe so we slightly speed okay. up a bit. Okay, okay, okay. Kim? Sorry. Okay, yeah, in fact, my, my question follows Marcos and Felicia uh, very well uh, in the sense of, instead of using terms like civil society, which is a pretty neutral term, would we not be better served with, with utilizing a term such as globalization from below and recognizing that it's based on different values, that these are values uh, of harmony with the, with the environment, with, uh, with people, with, with uh, enhancing human life and th stuff like that, and, and projecting that as opposed to this top-down globalization whether it's done by Chinese or American or British or whoever. Okay, please, Daya. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's again, thank you, Felicia and, and Kim. Uh, that's a fundamental question about the, you know, the environmental aspect of digitization and not just, uh, you know, undersea cable. Think of the amount of mobile phones we check out, you know, and what happens to these um, and, and how this whole electronic um, debris is sent to poorer countries to, you know, and the, and the, and the asso things associated with that, both health issues and, you know, degradation of environment, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's, that's a major concern, but I don't think it gets as much prominent that it deserves because the, the idea of, um, you know, we all have to get into the digital superhighways, especially in developing countries, a big thing, catch up, right? So these concerns are, which are more pronounced in, of course, in Europe or the US, uh, are not as big, unfortunately, because the, the, the race is to get to the latest gadget, the race, the race is to get to, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, they don't think about, um, even at policy level, you don't really see a lot of discussion um, uh, especially in developing countries. Um, I, I think, uh, for instance, in, in parts of Asia, big countries like China, India, relatively limited discussion. And I think it's a, it's a sad uh, commentary on, on the state of affairs because uh, this is a kind of hidden cost of digitization, you know, of, of the kind of life we're living. And I think this is something which deserves uh, more uh, attention. Um, in terms of globalization from below that Kim mentioned, I think that has, you know, I said to the response to Marcus's question, it is already happening. Of course, there is a power relation. We cannot equate a, a group of dedicated, earnest uh, activists who want to help human rights group in Southern Sudan uh, with the Chinese state, which wants to invest there to get some oil, right? So, so that I think that 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 uh, power equation is very important, but that's not to say that there is no space for globalization for below. It's actually well doc documented. There are numerous instances of civil society groups, or you know, if you like, globalization from below, uh, making a difference uh, in in various aspects of the world. Um, think of the you know gender uh, equality, think of migration issues. A uh, lot of people in many places in the world, especially I'm thinking in relation to uh, Western Europe, you know, with the recent migration crisis from the Maghreb and from, you know, Syria, et cetera, um, has, has had a very important contribution to making sure that um, they've used those digital connectivity to help uh, migrants in ways that have really made their uh, presence in, in Europe uh, more acceptable. So I think, you know, that, that globalization from below is 
in my view, that is going to be strengthened, in fact, because then more and more people get connected. So once they're through this kind of consumer phase, they get to maybe the next stage. It, the, the platforms are there. Um, but that's not to say, again, I might sound contradictory, but you know, the, the, the power of the big corporations to make us commodity itself, you know, each time we like something or we, you know, we are being used as, as a commodity. And I think that's something which is happening parallel to this. So, you know, it's, it's uh, so this, the globalization from above is also very significant. In fact, much more powerful than globalization from below. And therefore it takes a little, um, you know, uh, care and, and understanding to be able to not manipulate it by the, um, the big corporations and the data they have. Yeah. Sorry. Kim, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, but, but I slipped something before uh, Kim. Um, authoritarian governments, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, uh, and many others, with the internet tools, are generally the equation is, is not crystal, but are becoming stronger, more capabilities. This information, this the spread from Rupert Murdoch to Cambridge Analytica, and Wasim Khaled gave a talk on last Wednesday, is a formidable report analysis of anti-vaccination disinformation spreading colossally. So that if we just look at the technical prowess, the technical spread, or at the e-commerce spread, we are missing, or we are sidelining side some important dimensions. These technical tools are multi-purpose tools. They are omni-channel. And with our perspectives or values, we shouldn't simply highlight that which is um, desirable to us. Yes, there is I, a, I, yeah, a sorry. much larger drama. Sorry, Daya, please. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I um, maybe I gave that impression, but it was not meant to. I'm not, I'm not a champion of, uh, you know, I'm not a um, techno kind of, you know, obsessed person. I'm very bad with technology anyway, personally speaking. But, um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, they, you know, it's not just, um, as I said more than once, even in the most uh, liberal societies, the, um, the misuse of that, that connectivity, that technology is very well documented. Um, you know, we heard of Snowden and, you know, this whole surveillance structure. Uh, and that was not just confined to the citizens of the United States, that was a global operation. Um, and if you are sitting in Moscow, as Mr. Snowden is now, um, they are concerned because this is also about spying and, and you know, so this way back to, you know, the, 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 the old Cold War logic that you, you, this connectivity can also be misused and is misused by governments, by corporations, by uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, interest groups. Um, in fact, I'm, I think I, maybe I didn't mention, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on um, this, I'm calling it the changing geopolitics of global communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I'm actually doing a, a whole chapter on what I'm calling the geopolitics of crisis communication and looking at COVID specifically and this whole idea of, uh, you know, misinformation and conspiracy theories and how uh, it works in terms of the, uh, the geopolitics of it. So some of these misinformations are actually uh, sponsored by states or vested interests to create a certain narrative. And, and that's, that's a fascinating area of, of uh, research. Thanks, Daya. Kim, please. Yeah, thank you. let me push you a little further, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, when I'm thinking about globalization, most of us think about globalization from below. Most of us think about individuals, such as migrants or whatever, uh, consumers, things like this. But one of the things that gets left out of, out of the conversation, I think a lot, and perhaps you could comment on this, is what about the labor movement? Now, I'm not talking about the, necessarily the formal labor movement, but efforts to create uh, global uh, networks, say, across the global south, 
Uh, what about different labor mo movements such as in Brazil and South Africa and the Philippines, which have each overthrown dictatorships and things like that. Uh, in other words, an or organized collect collective behavior. And I'm just, I'll just throw that out and, and see if you have any further comments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think um, one would be, um, it would be safe to say that labor movements, organized labor movements are across the world are under tremendous pressure. Yeah. Um, and it's not just, I mean, it's interesting that in, um, in socialist China, actually it's very hard to unionize. There is hardly any mechanism to deal with um, abuse of labor laws. Uh, and in many democracies also, um, those powers that have been acquired uh, after a very long struggle for, you know, as you're saying in relation to Brazil, so, but actually in, in the United States, and think of Amazon as a case study and the, the power that, or the, the rights that people have who work for that organization. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a major, major concern. And my, unfortunately, my sense is that it's, is actually, you know, getting weaker, despite the tech, the, the platform that offers us possibilities of solidarity, because the the power from above is so strong, and they've they've created this whole idea of casualization of labor. You know, this the Brits call it the gig economy, right? Um, and that's becoming now uh, it's, it's globalizing, even in in supposed to be you know socialist countries, uh, China, not a good case. Okay, thank you. I think there are a key theme underlying your discussion is regulation. And Bradaho examines this compared to study. <laughs> strong regulation in the European Union with Germany as a great force. And of course, they have a, a commitment to data privacy because of their, their history also including Stasi and so forth. Um, China uh, with a very one-centric one concept of regulation and um, the United States with more wild West plus Pentagon approach to, to, to regulation, uh, homeland security. Um, Brad, do, do you have a, a consideration on this? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, one of my, so, so something that I propose is that, you know, we're, we're seeing different regulatory trajectories. And, and I think that, um, I think that you can almost say that there, are, yeah, there's like three sort of models that the world seems to be dividing into. You're either adopting the China model, sort of an authoritarian, um, as far as like data governance goes, sort of this authoritarian model of being like mm, the state decides what we do with the data. Um, we're doing the, the U.S. model where corporations do whatever they want with their data and sort of this European model, which seems to, well, it's it's emerging. Uh, they're, they're trying to uh, sort of, uh, I guess, yeah, globalization from below or civil society is trying to, you know, sort of take back the power from corporate actors or state actors as far as what can be done. Um, but I guess the way, mm, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that I think that there is almost th these these sort of three trajectories are there each in each center, uh, they're almost pushing to 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 spread their models. Uh, you know, China is interested in, you know, they want to sell their various, um, uh, censorship technologies, you know, through the digital Silk Road, you know, they're trying yeah, to basically sure. sell their model to um, the developing world. And I think the U.S. is trying to do the same. U.S. corporations are trying to, in a way, sort of gain more jurisdiction. Um, and Europe as well. You know, Europe is also proposing its model to be sort of this, uh, what do you want, the, the solution to the, the problem of, you know, the uh, power being sort of distributed among certain actors. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's, so, sorry, yeah, sorry, go on. Can we add a question of Abdul Ghaffar uh, from University of Peshawar, please? <clears throat> yes, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Jan. Uh, my question, uh, well, I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. My first question is related to patients as... Uh, sorry, sorry, say Sorry, say it again. There was a problem. Say it again. Your first question is about what? Regulations. Regulation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Brett talked about regulations, uh, in the past, it used to be uh, the state imposing regulations on uh, energy uh, companies, on internet companies, uh, and on multinational corporations. So uh, in the beginning, it was the state imposing uh, regulations. But now we have seen uh, that these big data companies can also impose regulations when it, uh, uh, the, the case with the Trump Facebook account, when it was deactivated and blocked. And recently the uh, Facebook authorities said that they are not going to give access to President Trump again to his Facebook account. So do you see uh, that uh, in the future or uh, in the coming future, there, going, there is going to be a challenge from uh, these big data companies to the sovereignty and authority of the state? First, uh, my second question is, uh, as we have reports that China and Pakistan uh, have developed their own optical fiber uh, for strategic communications. Uh, so do you see any prospects of China uh, posing a challenge uh, in the strategic arena to American dominancy because most of the strategic communication uh, done on the internet is controlled by the American and the Western uh, countries. So do you see that China will be posing any challenge to the American uh, supremacy in this area? Because we are having talks of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, superpowers, and the next great game or the next uh, Cold War will be between uh, uh, technologically advanced countries and China and America are the two most advanced, uh, artificially advanced countries. Like we have the 5G issue in the US. So do you see any competition in that area too? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Abdul. Both very, very interesting question. Very important questions too. Um, in terms of regulation, you see, if you think of Facebook, if it was a country, it would have the largest population on the planet. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hugely, hugely powerful organization, which has the capacity to actually stop the former president of the United States by using that platform. That is the level of, so of course, it did that after the president had demitted the office. He couldn't do that when he was in power. Um, so they have extraordinary uh, power. And we're talking about major states. Think of the world has nearly 200 states and territories. And majority of them do not have the kind of structures in place. Uh, they don't have the infrastructure to, um, to protect their sovereignty, the digital sovereignty. It's, 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 it's a, like you know, it's not a, it's a borderless world in that sense. So of course it gives um, the, um, the Facebooks of the world extraordinary powers. And it's a tragedy uh, of international uh, like policy arena that in despite of this becoming such a big issue uh, for last at least a decade, even longer, Snowden was, you know, I mean, that was the kind of ultimate of that time. Now it's moved on to a different level. Um, there isn't a global, uh, regulatory body, you know, there's no UN system in place which says, okay, we got to deal with this very, very important issue. And because there are, there are you know, competing interests and uh, United States has played a very important role to ensure it doesn't happen, um, you know, so that's, that's the answer to your first question. The second question about the, uh, the strategic communication, of course, uh, fundamentally important. Uh, but again, you know, a sense of Balance is important. If you think of the defense budget of the United States, uh, it's it's um, seven hundred billion dollars or something. It's bigger than the defense budget of the next ten countries united, and they talk about serious countries, right? So I don't think it is comparable yet. The, the United States has a far more sophisticated system in place. There's a longer history. The technology is far more advanced. But China is catching up. I mean, they've just been to Mars, if you remember. 
they have already launched a, a 6G satellite with the thinking of 6G, not 5G. Uh, so there is a, a very, uh, you know, there's a competition going on. But again, you know, we should be a bit more careful. You know, I have a PhD in international relations, so I'm in the wrong department. I should be teaching IR. But I do think that, you know, we, we tend to forget sometimes during the first Cold War, for instance, it wasn't the United States versus the Soviet Union. The Soviet, the Sino-Soviet split had happened way back in 1950s. India was a non-aligned country all through that. So these are like, we're talking about the 40% of the world's population, which was not part of this binary. So again, you, if, you, if you think like that, you will see, as Brett was saying in relation to this European Union, European Union is a serious player in the global space, right? Uh, and, and there are others who would, uh, Turkey is an important country, you know, in terms of its position. Russia is a very important country, you know, sitting is 10,000 nuclear weapons and energy superpower, you know, largest amount of free, fresh water in the world, et cetera. So it's a more complex story than this binary between, between Washington and, you know, uh, this so idea of G2, which is a construct, you know, some people put there to, to think in terms of binaries. I come from a tradition where there is actually um, I think Kim was mentioning about, you know, kind of different value systems. It's much more holistic view. Uh, it's not. It's not either or. It's actually and, which is the more interesting part. Thank you, um, Daya. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, in time-wise, um, maybe we can round off now. This is a marvelous discussion. Uh, your your data as well as the balance um, in your perspective, including the, the last one, the uh, holistic, um, both are formidable. So you give us a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have the recording online, I hope soon, and then many others can view it. Uh, Daya and all of you um, uh, viewers, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. All right. It's a great pleasure. And sorry it was so early for you. That's all right. I managed. I, I wasn't there. You managed to... very well. Thank you. Thank you. Now. The cup, cup, of, cup of tea helped. No, I, I have to go for a morning walk now. It's going to be dawn in a minute. So I'll go for a long walk. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you so Thanks. much. Thanks. So, Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Bye. Next Bye. week. Bye. Um, Bye. Next week, everybody, we're going to be hosting um, Andrea Deklich and Luciano D'Andrea, who will be talking about the socialization of science, uh, dealing specifically with the COVID-19 pandemic. So hope to see you all there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Brett. Aye. Thanks. Thanks, John. Aye. <laughs>